And we love those kind of Hollywoody kind of stories. But they're bullshit. Third greatest fear in life was death. Their second greatest fear in life is to walk into a room where you know nobody. And you probably know people's greatest fear in life is... People are listening to you and they don't really care much about what you have to say unless it changes their life. So just for anybody listening, I just love this notion. Nobody starts a large organization. There's a billion people on LinkedIn. 99.9% .9 don't post anything. Only less than 1% of 1%. And I, I, I take the line, now is the time to shine online. He says, how well you do your job contributes 10% to your career progress. He says, doing a super job and gets you on the ladder, doesn't get you up the ladder, gets you into the stadium of competition. You don't take out fire insurance when the house is burning down. You know, build your network now because you never know how critically important it could be in the future. To survive and thrive in these changing times, you need... Series 8 of the Dig podcast. I can't believe it, guys. We are almost at 100 episodes, over a quarter of a million downloads. And the growth of the podcast has been amazing. But I just have one thing I'm asking of you guys today. If you love listening to the Dig podcast and you love all the new guests each week, then I'm asking if you could hit subscribe or follow. So if you listen on Apple or Spotify, if you could hit follow. And if you watch on YouTube, hit that subscribe button. It means the podcast reaches more people. When I reach out, people actually actually have heard of the Dig Podcast, they know about it and they're more willing to be a guest. And then I'm able to bring even more actionable advice to you guys. So it's really, really, um, it's it really helps the podcast grow. So I'm asking for your help on that on that point today and I just can't wait to dive into this series. And um, Kingsley Aikens, what a name. I said to him, it's like a film star. That's what it's like when he walked in, a film star's name. He was telling me all the background about it. The only one with that name in Ireland, there's not too many people can say that, but he is a former chairman of multi-million euro lending platform Linked Finance and former president of the Worldwide Ireland Funds. He has a lot of things that he has done over the years. Too many things for me to mention, but um, we link all about Kingsley in the show notes and you can go and do all your research. But throughout his extensive career, he's come to appreciate the power of networking. Networking, what is that networking word? What does that mean? He sees it as the glue that makes everything happen. And it certainly is. We're networking today when we're sitting here. Um, we're doing it every day of our lives, perhaps without really realising, but we're going to dive deep into that today. But he's written extensively on diaspora, philanthropy and networking and has developed a range of online training programmes in these areas. He trains individuals in public speaking, which is so important in today's world. And he's spoken at TEDx and the Pendulum Summit. He was telling me all about that. He's awarded a CBE for his work on British-Irish relations. He helps people with their networking skills. And that's what I wanted to focus on today. He does so much, but I know you guys are going to love this part. How do we do it? How do we do it well? What do we need to do and what is it? So that's what we're going to talk about today on the Dig Podcast. Welcome, Kingsley. Wow, Caroline, what an introduction. I mean... Well, uh, you deserve every word of that on more. <laughs> Completely over the top and exaggerated, but I have to say, <laughs> no, not at all. It was exactly the same as the one I the one, the one I emailed you last week. Oh, so, so no, absolutely not. I was <laughs> researching, and you know, there's so much that you could say in the introduction, Kingsley. But you know, um, you've you've been like you've done a lot over the years, and been, you've lived in a lot of countries, isn't that right? Yeah, yeah, I lived in a lot of countries for sure. I mean, I've got that. I've always had that kind of Irish wanderlust. Um, you know, historically, ten million people left this island. You know, it's pretty amazing. Probably more people left this island per head than maybe any country in history. And that's the bad news, but actually the good news is 10 million people left this island because we now have an extraordinary global empire in many ways, you know, built not by military might or force of arms, but just the fact so many people have gone so many places. So everywhere I went in the world, I just found Irish people. And um, I started to kind of coalesce with them or start to bring them together, start to do stuff with them. I just found, found it was this amazing, had a global passport that uh, anywhere you go, you can you can use it. Uh, and my whole career is built around building networks, as you said. And the thing about networking is that, you know, you, you don't get taught this stuff at school or college, really. Um, you know, progress at school or college is all about a grade, a score, a metric, getting a mark. And that's fine, I understand it. And it's got nothing to do with the person sitting beside you in class. Then you get into the real world of work. And everything has got to do with the people around about you. And there's a whole series of things that count 
but can't be counted. You know, resilience and empathy and determination and grit and attitude and humour, and as we say down here, crack, they're all important, but you can't count them. And so whenever people are listening to this, they're like, right, well, how is this relevant for me and my business? And when we were downstairs, whenever um, we first met, you said you're busier than ever because of the effects of COVID and how that yeah. affected us as people in the world of work. What What's happening out there in, in the businesses and the people you speak to? What's going on? Well, I think the, the hidden cost of COVID uh, is that our networks have shrunk. Uh, we hunkered down with friends, family and kind of just a few business connections, what I call the inner concentric ring of your network. Well, we've strong emotional ties, but we've let slip um, with or even the outer concentric ring of our network. But we all used to have a lot of weak ties, but actually that's where opportunity lies with the weak ties because you know the strong ties too well. You know who they are, what they are, what they believe, all that kind of stuff. So that's a challenge and, and it's manifested, I think, sort of, you know, five really big issues for companies and individuals. Firstly, there's less business development. Secondly, there's less learning on the job, particularly, I, I feel, for the next generation. Um, thirdly, there's less randomness, serendipity, chance and luck encounters. Uh, and I'm a huge fan that luck plays a big part in your life. But the question is, can you make luck happen for you or is it an external thing that you have no control over? I think you can, you can make it happen. And then finally, you know, there's two big um, problems. One is less company loyalty. People aren't loyal anymore. They're moving and jumping like never before. And, and finally, company culture. How do you build a company culture when basically a lot of the time people aren't around? So companies are struggling with those issues and trying to figure out, you know, what is the answer? Now, we're not answer giving the whole answer, but we say one answer is that to survive and thrive in these changing times, you need to have a strong and diverse network. And your network's not just a safety net when things are going badly and you need it. It's also a trampoline when things are going well and kind of can bounce you into all sorts of different opportunities. But they don't happen lying in bed or sitting at your desk. They happen when you're out and about, when you do stuff, when you put your talents on display, when you talk to strangers, when you seek out unlike-minded people, when you break your routines, when you do what you're doing, build an online global platform and reputation and name. So these are all kind of really important things that, as I said, I don't think you get taught. I think they're the unwritten rules of progress in life that nobody really talks about. And can we learn them? I think you can learn them. And because I think that we often make a mistake about networking and we, we you know, you often hear somebody being described as a born networker. Mm -hmm. you, you're not born as a networker. It's a completely learned experience. And here's a mistake I think we tend to make. We, we mix up networking and sociability. We think the most social person is by definition the best networker. But actually that's not often the case. And bizarrely, and you might find this hard to believe and nearly counterintuitive, introverts can be better at networking than extroverts. And why is that? Because they do it with decency and authenticity. They ask questions, they're curious, they listen. They're all the skills of a good networker. And the extrovert wants to wow you, impress you, tell you about the people they know, looking over your shoulder to find somebody more interesting to talk to. Now, in any group of people, about a third are introverts, about a third are extroverts, and about a third are what we call ambiverts, which kind of got a bit of both. I think I'm probably in that category. In, in other words, I really enjoy being out and about and doing stuff socially. I'm a social animal, uh, but I also need time on my own. I need time to refresh to think, to be on my own. I think there's a difference between being alone and being lonely. Um, and being lonely, by the way, is one of the great crises of our times. We might talk about that a bit later because networking is a great antidote to loneliness. But they're all the reasons why I think, yeah, this is an important topic right now. Right now. I, so I've heard you speak about this before and I was getting my hair done. I wanted to have my hair nice for, for you today and get on all the guests and get my hair done with my hairdresser. And she's saying, who are you going to have on the podcast? And I said, oh, I have this guy, Kingsley Aikens, and he talks about networkers. Like, I'm so bad. Like, I'm so bad at that. I'm so shy. Yeah. I feel sick. And I said, but he said you're the best <laughs> because you can listen because you don't want to put yourself out there. So she was asking me, but how do I get better? So um, I went to an event, Kingsley, and a guy, you tell me whether this is good networking or bad. I felt like it wasn't good. So he said to me, he came over and he said, um, how are you? I said, I'm, I'm fine. And it was a business event, a conference. He said, who are you? And I said, oh, I'm Caroline O'Neill. And he said, 
no, no, I mean, what do you work at? <laughs> and I got offended by that. You know, I'm, yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm Caroline. I, yeah. I'm, I'm a person yeah. first and also, yeah. you know, how do you, and that, I suppose what I'm trying yeah. to ask is, how yeah. do you do it? For people who don't know how, if they go to an event and they, they're they saying, right, I'm here and I'm going to meet people, how do you do it? And, you know, I sympathize with the guy you met. You know, oh, yeah. I feel okay, a little right. bit sorry for him because okay. he didn't quite know what to do or say. Okay, yeah. And I actually think that you, you can turn those sorts of questions to your advantage. Um, let me give you an example. If you if you meet somebody and and, uh, and you ask them what they do and they say, um, I'm a tax advisor, that's pretty much the end of the conversation, you know. <laughs> but if they, if they say to you, I help people reduce their taxes, you know what that results in? A question from me saying, yeah. how do you do that? Yeah. Like, you know, so in a way, I think it's important to kind of make yourself attractive, you know, yeah. make yourself of interest as opposed to, you know, I, I'm, you know, I'm a, I'm a police sergeant or whatever it is. If you actually describe a little bit about what you do, you know, it just leaves, leads on to other sorts of conversations. Now, this isn't rocket science, <laughs> you know, it's all common sense, isn't it? It is, but do you think that here, especially in this country, we're very bad at elaborating on how good we are? So, so if I say, oh, I'm a hairdresser, what if I said, actually, I had to make people feel really good about themselves because I'm an expert at colour. Yeah. We're not very good at promoting ourselves yeah. that way. Do you think yeah. that or do you find that? Look, I think in, in everything, it's very important to kind of get your head around internal motivations and external motivations. Yeah. Let me give you an example. If, 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 you, if you have a, if your front garden is full of weeds and it looks awful, you're going to go down to the, the store to get some weed killer. And what you're buying is an external resolution of this which is to get rid of the weeds. But actually, you're not. You're getting rid of an internal problem, which is the embarrassment you feel about the neighbours looking at your weeds. Do you see what I'm saying? Yeah. yeah. You know, like it's digging deeper and it's like layers of an onion. Um, and, and I think really good conversations are good at that. They're good at asking not just questions, but follow-up questions. I mean, we, we do live in a remarkably, I think, uncurious time. I, I was at an event... Uh, the Pendulum Summit the other night, I sat with somebody for about two hours. I must ask them 50 questions and they never asked me a single question. They know nothing about me and my wife and our family and the kids and what I do, etc. I know everything about them. Now, I'm not that impressed by that person. So I think that getting the balance right there is a, is a bit of a bit of an art. Um, and, uh, you know, being clever about the sorts of questions that lead on to other questions. You know, you know it begins sentences with who, what, when, where, why and how. And end with a question mark. I mean, most people don't. So I think you can build a reputation for that, of being an interesting person and being an interested person. You know, like the old Dale Carnegie thing. You know, he said, be interested rather than interesting. So people then are kind of curious about, and the conversation starts and things go from there. But I take your point. I, I mean, there was a guy called Andy Lepata wrote a book in England and it was called And Death Came Third. And he did this huge survey and he found that people's third greatest fear in life was death. Their second greatest fear in life is to walk into a room where you know nobody. I mean, I, mean, I suffer from it. We all struggle with that. And you probably know people's greatest fear in life is public speaking. Oh, is, this, is that? That's the number one right, in every country in the world, public speaking. In fact, he said a funny thing. He said most people, when they're asked to give the eulogy at their best friend's funeral, would rather be in the coffin. Ah. <laughs> yeah. So if that's such a huge issue, then obviously that leads on to the networking being a problem as well, because basically you are speaking to someone that you don't know or whatever. So have you any, I know we're going to go back to the networking, but what about the public speaking thing then? Does that, is there something that people can be doing to help themselves in that area? Because we nearly all need to be public speakers in today's world. To get your message out there. Yeah, right? and, and I completely uh, agree. It is a real, real struggle. And I never did any until I went to live in Australia. And because of my job, I got up opportunities to get an, up and speak. And the first time I had to do it, I froze in front of 200 accountants in this event. And see, I just completely froze. I struggled. I just realized, actually, you have to work hard at this thing. You have to learn. We have to train to do it. And I said, this is never going to happen again. And I, I did a Dale Carnegie course. Um, and I spent time, you know, really sort of working at this area and I think it is a learned experience and I think you can get over fears and nervousness and uh, feeling sort of shy and all those sorts of things I think you can do all of that but you do it, it does take effort mm -hmm. and not everybody is that comfortable about it but it's hugely important 
if you can get up and speak convincingly, compellingly, entertainingly, I don't mean in terms of telling lots of jokes, but yeah. just being defer self-deferential, you know, to being sort of a little bit of vulnerability perhaps, um, sharing your story. We all love stories, you know, um, and realising, and I think this is probably the biggest mistake people make about public speaking, is that the people are listening to you and they don't really care much about what you have to say unless it changes their life. And so they see what's happening through the lens of what's this person going to say that's going to impact on me, going to help me. And so you get a lot of people get up and they say, well, our company was founded in 1850. You know, we've grown 20% a year in customer satisfaction for the last 80 years. You know, we've built markets in 185 countries around the world. People don't care. Oh, they don't care? They don't care. But yeah. they want to know, what can you do? What can you say today that I will leave here? So when I go to these conferences, the number one thing I have in life is a notebook in my back pocket and a pen. And I take notes. And I always think at the end of that conference, I, I look back. And if it's empty, that was a poor conference for me. But if it's chock a block, that was a great conference. Mm -hmm. So we all have to keep working out of this stuff. We do. And I suppose with the online world now, we're public speakers on our own platform. So if you lift your phone to be on social media, that's very much public speaking in the new world. So I made a lot of businesses um, and business owners and people in the world of work, Kingsley, that have this fear of representing their brand online because they have to speak to the camera and then they're speaking to thousands ultimately. Yeah. Yeah. So that's yeah. a big block for them yeah. and they're yeah. not doing that. And I always yeah. say, well, actually, you're missing out in towns, thousands of people about yeah. your product or service. Yeah. Um, ha have you any tips for them for that? I suppose it's the same kind of thing as standing up in front of people, but any key thing that they could think of for embracing their um, brand and business like that in a public speaking kind of way online? Well, there's, there's now a billion people on LinkedIn, and I know you're strong across the social yeah. media spectrum, but I, I've particularly focused on LinkedIn. I'm conscious there's a billion people on LinkedIn. 99.9% .9 don't post anything. Really? Only less than 1% of 1% actually post or actually are active. So immediately, if you do stuff, there's an opportunity there. And I, I, I take the line, now is the time to shine online. It's here in front of you. It's an opportunity. They're not going to be your bosom buddies. And I think that's where one of the things we, we talk a lot about is you have to audit your network. You have to divide it into different categories. And these people in, you know, Sierra Leone or Venezuela or New Zealand, they're not your close bosom buddies, but they're part of an online tribe. So now you can create an online tribe. You can have an offline tribe, you know, and you have to segment and, uh, you know, when, when I, I divide my network into, it's like a pyramid, four different categories. Um, at the very bottom, it's a contact. It's somebody that's on my network, on my Outlook system, for example. And for the life of me, I can't remember who they were. I must have met them at a reception, on a flight, at a party, you know, at a conference. But anyway, got a business card and put it in the detail. But I don't know who they are. So that's very, very weak. But if you're moving up the pyramid, the next category is a connection. I know them, they know me. We're not doing anything together. But if I called him, he'd know who I was or she would know who I was and vice versa. That's better, but smaller. Then moving up again, it's a relationship. I know them, they know me. We're doing business together. We like each other, we know each other and then the killer app, we trust each other. And we live in a world now where trust is at its lowest level in recorded history. I mean, the Edelman Global Trust Survey comes out every year and says trust in four institutions, government, media, non-profit and business is at its lowest level ever. But the good news in that is that if you build a name and a reputation for trust and being trustworthy, what an incredible competitive advantage that gives you. So that's great. And then at the top of my pyramid, when I'm segmenting my network, I had called a friend. I have people I work with are friends. I have friends who are friends. But I wouldn't have that many. I would maybe have 12 to 15 in this category. Because I define it as somebody you could call on their cell phone on a Sunday afternoon. And you wouldn't do that to many people. The sort of person you turn to if you live a personal crisis or a family issue or something. So now suddenly, this huge bundle of names, when you do that exercise, and I encourage everybody to do that exercise, you've got a bit of shape on it. You'd also realize you can actually clean up your network when you do this exercise. You've got a lot of redundant entries. You know, you've got a, you know, a takeaway fish and chip shop and dairy, just, you know, you're never going to be there again. You don't need this. You know, we, we say prune your network and watch it grow. So clean up your network. Then the second thing you'll discover 
is there are whole areas where you know nobody. You know nobody in aircraft leasing or reinsurance or tourism, whatever the category is that people are interested in. So you got you got to sort of build that up. And then the third one, which is kind of like the gold dust of one, you discover you had some great connections in the past and you've let them slip. So they're what we call dormant connections. Um, and they're the people you had a grand relationship. Nothing happened. You didn't have a row or a fight. It's just that life gets in the way, you know, family and business and it all gets in the way and you've lost touch of these people. So what I did during COVID was make one connection every week. It was for nearly eight, 70, 80 weeks, you know, um, I just had these phenomenal reconnects because I lived in a series of different countries. Um, and I realized, you know, God, there's, you know, the hidden gems of your network is in the redundant, is in, is in the dormant connections that are there. And we often don't realize that that's there. Uh, it, it could be a phenomenal potential. So is that a good place to start, putting in your network, seeing where all everyone is and getting started? Because one of the questions I have, I have here is everyone starts from somewhere. You read that you had written that in, in one of your LinkedIn posts. Um, yeah. Like, what do you mean? What is that? What that means? You have to start somewhere. But where yeah. do you start? Is that where you start? And then, yeah. like, yeah. what's the action people need to be well, taking here when they're listening? Yeah, I mean, what I was kind of at the back of my mind was the biggest company in the world today is Apple Computers, mm-hmm. and in my lifetime, it started in a garage in Cupertino, in California, with a twenty-one-year-old guy son of a Syrian migrant called Steve Jobs. And his pal, 27-year-old Steve Wozniak, put together some bits and pieces and sold a computer. And that's in our lifetime. Around the corner, you had Bill Hewlett and Doug Packard with a printing company in a shed. Disney's first cartoon came out of a garage. Amazon started in somebody's front room. Facebook started in a dorm in, um, in, in Harvard. Starbucks started in somebody's front room up in Seattle. Ryanair on this island started with one plane and 18 passengers in 1985 and flopped across from Waterford to London. That was the first flight of Ryanair. They'll do 25 million this month. So my point in all of this is nobody starts a large organization. Everything starts at zero. And my experience was I I worked for an organization called the Ireland Funds, and it was a network of the Irish diaspora around the world set up by two really inspiring guys, one called Tony O'Reilly, head of the Heinz Food Company. And the other guy was Dan Rooney, ancestors from Newry in Northern Ireland and they he owned the Pittsburgh Steelers a football team in the United States and they had an idea they had a notion that there's such a thing as an Irish empire I touched on this earlier uh, and it's all around the world and maybe we could build a network of these people to engage particularly back in those days with Northern Ireland um, and so it was just an idea so we had a big black tie dinner in the Waldorf story in New York you know the great and the good all came the dinner was so unsuccessful. The only reason we had a second dinner a year later was to pay for the first dinner. <laughs> and that's $700 million ago. So just for anybody listening, I just love this notion. Nobody starts a large organization. Everything starts at zero. In our case, it was minus. <laughs> a lot of people's cases and, you know, there's people listening with lots of different stories and, you know, they're probably thinking, right, I- I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to start getting out there. And you t- we touched on it at the start about listening like you and you said we'll we'll come back to that so um yes you get people who um talk about themselves and 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 tell you everything they're good at but they didn't listen to you is there any tips around that or anything else you want to ta- talk to us about being a good listener when you're at these events and you know what what's the key things really well i think the thing we're always fighting is that most people are what we call narcissistic listeners so if i say to you caroline i'm thinking about a car and you say I bought one last week. The guy wanted 20,000. I got him down to 10,000. It was just fantastic. He's doing 50 miles a gallon. Love this car. You've taken my topic, you've hijacked, and you've made it your topic. Now, people do that all the time. They just just reach across and grab your topic and just bore the hell out of you talking about it. So I think that that's uh, you know, a battle we've got to fight against, the kind of narcissistic listeners. But I also think um, you know, it's important to see the difference between listening and, and hearing. You know, you know, you really want to hear what somebody is saying, you know, in depth, what they're kind of saying. Very often people are kind of very shallow listeners. They're not really listening to what you're saying. They're kind of looking over your shoulder and they're taking the time that you speak to prepare what they're going to say next, not to hear what you're saying. Can you spot someone? Oh, it's so obvious. It's so obvious. 
It, it's so, you know, it's like written on their face. Uh-huh. I, as soon as you stop, I'm going to start talking uh-huh. to myself, you know, me, me, me. I mean, it's just, you see it everywhere. Recently, I've been doing some research on different like conditions, family, like things that are going on in different fam- health conditions online. And, you know, it's very hard sometimes to find the right information. And definitely my go to now is Mars Pharmacy. I found Mars online during COVID, actually, and started to follow along, started to follow the owner, Una, and all the unreal advice she was given for everyday issues that we all experience, educating us on on things that are going on in everyday life, but we just don't know the facts and how to treat those things and how to, you know, what we should be doing and just unbelievable education, really. And that was started my relationship with Mars way back a few years ago. And we're absolutely delighted that they're now the partner for the Dig podcast. And you're going to hear a little bit more about them today. At Mars, we're proud to serve our communities, arming our customers with knowledge and information needed to take control of their health. Our expert teams are on hand to support and advise you in relation to all areas of your health and well-being, whether that be vitamins and supplements, hormonal health, gut health, or skin care and beauty. At the Mars Skin Lab, we offer a wide selection of tailored skin care treatments and products from cosmeceutical ranges, including Image Skin Care, SkinCeuticals and Murad. Call into any of our 10 stores in Dublin or visit us online at marshpharmacy.ie or you can contact us on social media for advice and support. Shop our wide range of wellness, beauty and skincare products online at marsh.ie. All orders are packed with care in our busy Dublin warehouse. And don't forget, we also ship to Northern Ireland and you can enjoy 15% off all full priced items online with the code DIG15. Thank you so much for that, Una. And now back to our guest on the DIG podcast. So, you know, even think, Caroline, do you know three or four people who are really great listeners? Um, how would you rate yourself as a listener? Um, and it's this whole notion of seeing listening as a form of activity, you know, listening not just to what somebody says, but what they're going to say next. And that's kind of giving them this kind of enormous sense of power. I mean, networking essentially is all about giving rather than getting. And, and the greatest thing you can give somebody is the gift of rapt attention. And when somebody is really listening to you intensely and correctly and asking the right questions and using the right verbal graffiti, the mm, uh, eh, they actually make you think better. You know, you're not competing with them. You know, you're not fighting with them to hold their attention for the next because you're worried that they're going to be drifting away somewhere. So I, I'm just a, I'm a huge fan of listening. I'm a huge fan of curiosity. I'm a huge fan of the notion of you know, being, having a growth mindset rather than a fixed mindset. And if you ever come across the writing by, writings by Carol Dweck, a Stanford professor, she's written a lot on this and TED Talks and YouTube videos, etc. cetera. Um, and, and, and what she's basically saying is, you know, people with a growth mindset, they see every setback, they see every mistake, they see every kind of challenge as just a way of getting better for the next challenge in front of them. And people with a fixed mindset basically say, this is the way things are. I was, bo- I was born this way. It ain't going to change. Things aren't going to work out, et cetera, et cetera. And, and it's a really fascinating way of dividing the world into two types of mindsets, growth versus fixed. And whenever you um, embrace networking and you're working on the listening skills and you're pushing yourself out of your comfort zone, what's the great things that can happen? Like, why, why, why is it important that people do this? And we did touch on it, but I mean, I want people to realise when they're listening, so... People on the Dig podcast that listen, Kingsley, are everybody, right? There are people that work for people. There are people that have their own businesses. There's startups. There's bigger companies. But uh, this is important for everyone. What can happen when we, when they embrace this? First of all, you never know who somebody knows. I mean, I don't know who lives next door to you. I don't know who your cousin is. I don't, so by having that con- our conversation and then asking these questions and listening, suddenly I'm just increasing this incredible sort of stock of knowledge I have. But the basis of all of this is that, you know, there is this kind of myth of individualism out there, that life is about the rugged individual taking out, the, taking on the world and winning. You know, it's the Lone Ranger, it's the Marlboro Man, it's the Wonder Woman, you know, just, you know, this. And we love those kind of Hollywoody kind of stories, but they're bullshit. Life is about connecting, collaborating, cooperating. You know, the way to people you don't know is for people you do know. So when you realize that, and when you realize that you're only one introduction away 
from a life changing decision. I mean, think back to how your, you know, your career shifts, how you met your partner, your husband, how you met, you know, got to took up a hobby, how you started this initiative here. Very often, it's just you're just one conversation away, but they don't happen lying in bed or sitting at your desk or, as I said, all those different things. They happen when your mindset says, I'm going to be out and about, I'm going to be asking questions, I'm going to be curious, I'm going to change my routines, I'm going to talk to people not like me. I mean, we're living in a city now in Dublin, which when I was growing up, we used to, we used to say Dublin was male, pale and stale, right? It was not a very cosmopolitan international city. I was telling a joke the other day when I was in college in my final year here, I went into a restaurant and I asked the waiter, what's the soup du jour? He said, hang on, I'll ask the chef. So he goes in and he asks the chef and he comes out and he says, it's soup of the day, right? <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, but now it is an extraordinarily sophisticated city. And, and when I was growing up here, you know, only a tiny percentage of people in the city were not born in Ireland. But now it's over 20%. Like it's only 14% in the US. It's over 20% here. But here's the question. Does your network reflect the diversity of the economy you operate in, the society you live in? And all the research by the McKinsey's and the Baines and the World Economic Forum, it all says the same thing. If that's the case, you as an individual and you as a company underperform. So we have to find ways to seek out people who are different from us and listen to them and make sure that the diversity of this world, this exciting world that we're in, is reflected in the environments in which we operate. So true. I'm, I, I'm listening and that's I am. I'm like, that's because it's so much information. Sometimes you have to like process it. And it, it, this is out of some people's comfort zone. The opportunities that can happen when you do it are huge. Like reaching out, for example, reaching out to you on LinkedIn, right? As I go, oh, he'll never say yes to me. He's never going to say yes. Sure, look at him. Like he's away traveling around the world. Big, you know, big, like professional <laughs> man. Right away, you know. You proved me wrong. You wrote back. You, I knew it was from you and not a bot that was writing on LinkedIn. And, um, you know, so nice when you came here and all. And for anybody that's listening, I suppose that's my example of um, reaching out, stepping outside your comfort zone, having the confidence to do it, even though you might say no and I'll be embarrassed. But, yeah. you know, look at us now and you're sitting here and I'm getting all of this knowledge for everybody that's listening. So that's, I suppose, if people are listening, that's one of my examples recently where I just bit the bullet for Series 8 and said, I'm going to. Going to ask the big guys and see what they say. Yeah, exactly. thank you. What's the worst thing that can happen? I know, I know. It's a very worst. We're pride, thing. maybe, and oh god, I'm not good enough. But yeah. you know, at the end of the day, that's perception on my behalf that you, you're probably busy or whatever. Mm -hmm. So it's about analysing all of that. But um, I went to um, networking events when I read my shop. Remember, I told you I had yeah, a shop. Yeah, yeah. And um, I was trying to, I was trying to get the shop off the ground and meet people and get people to know about it and all of that and. I went for years and I remember my daddy saying to me, you're running all them things and you're not making a penny. And what good's that to you? And um, I said, oh, but I'm meeting all these people. And actually, a lot of the people I met are people now that have helped me, like like the man behind the camera today, uh, Ryan Loney from BNL Productions. So I went to a conference that he was speaking at and they were work colleagues. So yeah. I suppose that's another example too. But everything you're saying, I know is going to have so many people and, and help them step outside the box now. What about struggling to get the doors open? Is that the way to perhaps getting those doors open for people to put some of these things into practice? Like if, if there's one thing you wanted people to take from the podcast today that are struggling perhaps in the world of work, what would it be? Well, I, I think to go back to the story that you told about your own experience and your dad's comments, I mean, I think we're always struggling with activity versus progress. Yes. You know, and, and that's where I suppose I sympathise a little bit with your dad in that He's kind of looking at this and he's saying, you're not being harsh enough. You know, you're not being selective enough. I don't think he's saying, don't do any of this stuff. I just, he's probably saying, be a little bit more selective and, you know, be careful of how you, you know, your waste in his notion, yeah. wasting your time. So I think, um, you know, getting that kind of balance uh, is what it's about. I think in a career sense, and I'm a fan of a guy called Harvey Coleman, an American guy, and he has a, he's a thing called the Pi Theory of Career Progress. And P stands for performance. And what he says is, is really incredible. It's, it's like ridiculous at one level. He says, how well you do your job contributes 10% to your career progress. Now, when I read that, I said, no, that must be a misprint. It's just, it's got to be like 80%. Do, you know, it's got to be 80% of career progress doing a super job. And he says, no, he says, doing a super job um, gets you on the ladder, doesn't get you up the ladder, gets you into the stadium of competition. He said, doing a super job is the minimum. It's expected of everybody, you know. 
you know, everybody does a super job. So if it's only 10%, what's the rest of the pie theory? And he said, well, the eye of the pie is 30%. And he said, that stands for your image. What do people think of you? What do they know about you? Um, what's your reputation? You know, your reputation is what somebody says about you when you're out in the room and all that kind of stuff. So that's interesting. But then the really amazing thing is he says 60% of career progress is about E. And e stands for exposure. Who's seen you in action? Who's seen you deliver? Who's seen you speak? Do you do visible work? Do you do invisible work? He said you get paid on performance. You get promoted on what other people think of your potential. And one of the interesting things about networking is that early in your career, you tend to get paid for what you do. But later in your career, you get paid for who you are. And your network will help you become who you are. It'll be a function of the people you spend time with, the sort of work that you're doing here. So I think that's, that's all fascinating stuff because these are the unwritten rules of progress in a career sense, in a post third level, fourth level education sense. And, and it's, kind of, it's kind of revolutionary. And I, I love, there's a woman called Carla Harris does a lot of TED Talks. Uh, she was 35 years in Morgan Stanley in New York. She's retired now and she's written books. And she said a line that I can never forget this line when I heard her say it. She said, every major decision about you and your career and your progress and your compensation and uh, your promotion will be taken by a group of people sitting around a table in a room and you won't be in that room. Wow, how true is that? I mean, we all know that's true. So the keys to your career success are in the hands of other people. And if nobody knows you, if nobody knows how you've contributed to the success of the organization, guess what? They move right along to the next name. Now, this is harsh stuff, you know. It's harsh stuff. <laughs> it's harsh stuff. So you have to, and this is why your network's important, because you have to become known. I always say you have to become known, not famous. You don't have to become a Kardashian. But you Thank God. <laughs> that we're not going to <laughs> You're become. okay now. You're going to relax. I'm going to relax. <laughs> <laughs> but you've got to be known for something. Yeah. So you've got to find your niche. And then what's your niche within your niche? And what's your reputation and, and how, why do people know you for doing this kind of stuff? And again, you know, I, I just think people don't get told these things. Some of it is harsh realities of career progress, but they're critically important. And very often people only realize these things when it's a little bit too late. Because, you know, is life fair? Well, sometimes you could argue it's not fair. But what I'm saying is, you know, equip yourself, you know, you don't take out fire insurance when the house is burning down. You know, build your network now because you never know how critically important it could be in the future. Um, and just spend time, work at it, but mo mostly look for diversity within it. And guess what? It'll come back to serve you. Well, everyone's listening. They're like, right, we're, we're, and, and it's not easy finding the right places to be and the right people to be around but she said it's work it's hard work sometimes networking totally, but totally, you know yeah. and you have to push yourself out of your comfort zone and I yeah. did come back to daddy that time and say you know I, I'm going to meet people here and I actually met one of the um my colleagues that I now own a business with the Northern Ireland Social Media Awards and as I said Ryan who's behind the camera from B&L Productions and um, Kasha the photographer and the most amazing people that I would not have yeah. if I hadn't done that so yeah. um, I, I keep saying to him now daddy but I suppose when you said it's like put up like how's that he was always thinking of your business surviving but it's a bigger different world now where we need to get out there as you said but mm. I suppose it hasn't really changed we've always needed to be networkers and listeners and all but I think nowadays I don't know it's, it's expected that your people know as you say what you're doing and how they're going to know if you're not telling them I think the challenge is you know to be high tech and high touch yeah and I think I heard you talk about we're veering, that we're veering down the road of being just purely high tech and I'm not against Technology. I'm not. A, I love my my phones and my LinkedIn and all that. And I think AI is going to have some extraordinarily beneficial effects, particularly in things like healthcare, etc. But I do worry that we're hurtling down this road at the cost of what we are, which is social animals. We crave human contact. I mean, one of the things CEOs say to me very often is that, and I, I don't like to dish on the next generation because I have a few of them, <laughs> but. <laughs> But that the next generation, they don't want to speak. 
they don't want to pick up the phone. Um, they, you know, they will text rather than talk. And I think they're missing out something and all of that. I have some sympathy with them as well because many of them spent time at home when they should be out. They should be sitting into meetings. You know, they should be learning on the job. They should be thrown into all sorts of different environments. I mean, when I was working with the trade board here, oh my goodness, you learned so much in the pub. Yeah. <laughs> on a Thursday and a Friday night. I mean, you learned how the thing, you know, how the job, the politics of the organization, the whole thing works. Um, I made friends there that are still my friends today. Um, boys met girls. I often wonder where that's happening. You know? yeah. Of course, everybody says online, but I'm not sure how good that is. Yeah. So I just think <clears throat> we ought to be careful that the world doesn't become very atomized, that we live very individual lives. But cities like Sydney, uh, cities like Paris and Stockholm, about 65% of people live alone. So I actually think loneliness is the big price we're paying for recent events. And the Harvard Longitudinal Study on Loneliness, which is the longest ever study, it's 18 years I've been studying, says that loneliness and isolation are more damaging to your health than obesity, alcohol, and drugs. I mean, what a statement, you know? Um, and they've studied all the different blue zones around the world, and all these sorts of things. But essentially, you know, what keeps people going is community, is belonging. I'm a huge fan of the concept of belonging. I mean, the diaspora thing I do is all about people wanting to belong. It's not necessarily to a country, it can be to a place. I mean, people are very passionate about Belfast and they rather hope Cork falls over, right? <laughs> <laughs> but I think that's a fascinating yeah. concept. People belong to football teams, you know. Um, Club. They, they belong to clubs, they belong to all sorts of different things. And it becomes part of their identity and who they are and they get self-expression through it. And I, I think you know, we've got to be careful we don't starch that out of our lives. Oh, Daphne, and so much. I, I always say to people, like the Dick podcast specifically, well, yes, we're all working and we want to do well and we want to progress, but it's about our life ultimately. Like everything you're saying there is really life first, like connection and community and, yeah. you know, you know, progressing with our friends and our family and our network. Yeah. That's life. That makes you happy in life as well. Yeah, uh, you know, obviously yeah. we'll open the doors in business. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That leads me to the the bit of um, so Mars Pharmacy, who you know, now you've shared a stage with yeah, him yeah. before. He so, so he's partnered up with the Dick Podcast, and I suppose like Mars is a pharmacy, and but they're all about wellness, um, mm -hmm. uh, Kingsley, and how to look after yourself and how to be the best you can be before perhaps you might need different medications, which are obviously a face for that. But they're all about looking after your yeah. your wellness, and mm -hmm. um, they're partnering up with the podcast. And I I said to Una, I'm going to ask each guest when we come to the end of our conversation a question that, that I think is very relative for for us partnering, but also for everybody listening, thriving in business and life. So you can't, I don't believe, maybe you could say I'm wrong that you could thrive at work and not be thriving in life as in. They, they're they're connected, right? Yeah. What do you do? I'm asking you. How do you look after yourself to okay. be the best you can be in yeah. work and life? You know, different people say different things. But yeah, different things. Look, I mean, m mine is fairly boring. Um, I try to look after myself in a, in a physical sense. So yeah. I, I I do something every day. In the summer months, I swim every day. Um, I go to the gym and swim here. Then on a kind of a mental side, I've started doing over the last few years. I have a bucket list, right? Okay. So. Um, three years ago, four years ago, the bucket list was to perform stand-up comedy. What? So I went to the Gaiety Theatre, I did a 12-week course, and then I had to perform in a nightclub to graduate. I think I had to have 21 laughs in seven minutes or something, there was some sort of crowd thing. But I did it, you know, it's totally outside my comfort zone. I, had, I didn't tell any friends, but one friend came and he emailed me the next day and he said, uh, I wouldn't give up the day job. And <laughs> so, so that's that. Then last year I decided, because I present a lot in different countries, I'm always embarrassed. Like I was in Kosovo before Christmas, 400 people there, everybody spoke perfect English. So could I learn to present in another language? So I had lived in France, I had a ba ba good base in France. So I took a month last summer and I went to a school in the south of France. And I did an intensive French course to learn how to present in French. So that was last year's. Um, then this year, um, I am just started two nights ago a calligraphy class, class. because I, I like I always tell people write handwritten notes you know don't send an email reply to three emails every week with a handwritten note you know and it's so powerful but I don't have a very good script so this class in the Black Rock Education Centre 
is over eight weeks and they teach you how to use a calligraphy pen. And so I'd love to be able to, there's an, you know the old line, what comes from the hand goes to the heart. And not many people write handwritten notes of thank you to people and recognition to people. So, so that's this year's kind of plot and plan. How do you get time to do all that? Well, it's an evening class. It's six, six to eight, you know, like, you know, just so I can goof off. You know? <laughs> but you make the time. Obviously, you're making the time to make those bucket, that bucket list yeah. happen and all of that. And then that's happening. You've yeah. filled. I think, um, so I'm a fan of mar- the theory of marginal gains, that being 1% better doesn't get you 1% more. It often gets you a lot, lot more. And being 1% worse often gets you not 1% less, but actually often gets you nothing. So I used to work for IDA. We were involved in getting foreign investment into Ireland. And if we won an FDI, a foreign direct investment deal, fantastic. If we came second, we got nothing, even if it was like that. And I, I developed this notion that very often you need one piece of information that can be what I call the nudge factor. And that nudge factor would always come from an individual, somebody in your network who give you a piece of information, a piece of advice, make an introduction. So I call these people tipping agents. So when looking to get a deal, I try to find out who are the tipping agents, what was the nudge factor, how could they help me with that? And if we could just nudge that deal, just a 1% more, the implications could be enormous. Now actually it's, um, I learned all this from Sir David Brailsford who was head of UK cycling after a century winning nothing. He introduced marginal gains as an approach to cycling, professional cycling. And he broke down cycling into every constituent element and improved every element by 1%, 1%, 1%. And they won a stack of medals in London, Rio and Tokyo. Then he turns his attention to the Tour de France. The UK had never won the Tour de France. In fact, Ireland had won it before the UK had won it. And he applied the same principles. He brought the cyclists in beds from hotel to hotel in France, their pillows from hotel to hotel every single thing and they won six Tour de France in seven years. So I love that notion of marginal gains. How do you break down everything you do and just increase it by a tiny amount because when it all comes together it can be that significant nudge that wins you a deal. That's some way to end. <laughs> Unbelievable because some people think it takes these huge strides and they, no. I can't speak in front of or hundred people, but actually, you know, maybe you could do a small video to your camera in front of the audience you have, and that's a small thing that could. So, uh, you know, that's going to have so many people when you say that. Yeah, sort of things. What do you call it? It's marginal. Marginal gains. The theory of marginal gains. Um, you know, small little differences can have gigantic implications. It's a little bit like, you know, you have those little um, cards and things, and you flick one over, and then you know. The, mm. the knock-on effect. Yeah. It's back to something you said earlier before the podcast. It's like the ripple effect, you know. Yeah, the ripple effect can be phenomenal in life. And yeah. you know? um, whenever I wanted to start the Dig podcast, um, this isn't about me, but I just want to tell you the story. Um, and I I didn't know how to do a podcast, Kingsley, like no clue. I loved the idea. Couldn't even spell the word. I didn't know <laughs> how this works. I just knew I needed to try to help businesses that were reaching out and I didn't know how to do it. So Ryan Loney from B&L Productions says, we just start, Caroline. Just, yeah. just, yeah. I'll drive you. You weren't supposed to drive yeah, yeah. over out in the road. Okay. He drove me a microphone and the earphones yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and he dropped them on. He was just start. Yeah. So I did my first guest and I, I forgot to press record. <laughs> right. I know. So that's like me and you getting to the end. I mean, you saying, <laughs> and I said, Kingsley, I didn't record one bit of that. Right. So my pride, everything. No, of course. Like, Christ. But never happened again. Never happened again. Right. But I said, uh, so then I, I phoned him and he said, look, just do the next one a wee bit better. Let's just do let's just do it a wee bit better and he kept saying that to me and then the next series he said let's just do this wee thing here so he must have known this, this theory mm. without telling me but um, without people like that as well so your knowledge and his knowledge and everybody we small things so I never I'd never forgot to press record again and it's just making those small changes but sure. that might help some people to sure. so sure. thank you so yeah. much for sharing that um, sure. thank you for being on the Dick Podcast you said we now along with Agatha could talk for three hours we and you could talk for hours and hours I hope this isn't the last time, but I, I didn't know, a, like the ripple effect you talked about, I didn't know about you actually until my friend Mary seen you speak at a conference. She's like, you need to follow this man, he's unreal. And then the ripple effect and now we're, you're on the podcast. Yeah. I hope, I can't wait to see now all the different things that you're doing, all the places you're speaking. Um, maybe someday you'll come back and Love we'll yeah. do another yeah. topic. Because you just never know. You never, you never know. know. Yeah, I know. And, so, uh, yeah. Um, and um, I just want to thank you for being here and hopefully we're going to see you on the Dig podcast again soon. And I just want to say to everyone that's listening, um, thank you for tuning in today. Uh, Kingsley was unreal. I, 
I have loads of work to do too with networking and listening and pushing myself outside my comfort zone. But even we small things, I think that's the thing I took from it today. It doesn't have to be the big steps like talking in front of hundreds of people or, you know, making these huge strides. Small things can actually open loads of doors. So thank you for listening to the Dig Podcast. You can listen on Apple, Spotify, YouTube. And don't forget to hit that follow and subscribe button. It helps us reach even more people with this amazing advice like from our guest today.